Hey Flosstube, it's Kim aka Spartan Stitcher on Instagram and I am back again with another weekly cross stitching update. Today is the 19th of October 2020. This is video number 91 and I worked on four different pieces this week. So let's get to the stitching. Uh, I finished up my week on Witches by Oberlin Samplers aka MM Waldock Designs. So, um, pretty much all I added to it is I did the witch and her cat on an S. So one more letter done. A total of, I think that's a total of 1,300 stitches, uh, for the week. Yeah. 1,300 stitches for the week. So almost half done. I just, ha just have to do the, the backstitch letters and ghosts and goblins down here and then this half will be done besides the little tiny words at the top and the bottom um once i get to that point i might rechart the words to make them more fun it says witches brew magic spooky ingredients spiders crickets bats witchcraft toadstools invisible powder cobwebs quills and warts um, so just like I did with the Michigan piece that I've already stitched of theirs, uh, I might just completely change those words to make them into some, something more fun. I could, uh, bring in some Harry Potter, you know, type ingredients, um, for some of the sp spells and potions they did. So, uh, there we go. There's one week's progress on my new start, Witches. And then on Wednesday or Thursday, I started my third start for Out of the Stash at Last Hashtag, which is Lizzie Kate's Halloween Rules. Um, sorry, this that's the best picture I have for you. It's on the back of, um, so there's 12 charts, two charts on each little leaflet. And I dyed my own 28 count Monaco to a similar tan color. I used Rit Camel. And I'm doing it one over one. So it's teeny tiny. And I started at the um, top center with the little pumpkin. And I might be able to get the um, top piece done uh, by the time I have to put this piece down on Wednesday. So there is, let's see, 1,200 stitches so far. So that's all I have left to do is finish the one uh, light light gray tombstone to dark gray tombstones and do the moon. Um, and I'm using the DMC equivalent for this, but it calls for the, the charted color is Weak Style Works. Um, I forgot the color. But you can see it's like a, a golden brown moon with some variegation in it. Um, I still have in my stash a partial skein of Karen Waterlily's Lemon and Lime, which is what Glendon Place moons are on her charts. Let me cover my face. Um, so it's Lemon and Lime colors. I might substitute that instead of using the DMC equivalent, which is 783 to give you a... Um, you know, it's a, it's that golden brown tan color, but I think this would be more fun. Um, I'm not sure how much you'll be able to see the variegation because it is doing one over one and it's teeny tiny. So that's what I have so far. 1200 stitches. And that's, that's as wide as it gets. So I just parked my threads instead of stitching all the way down. Um, and... Like the fabric isn't even wide enough to, to put in the sides of my Q snap. So it's only clamped on the top and the bottom. But that is Halloween rules. A couple more days on that. And I worked on Big Red Ship of Life by Ink Circles. Working on this page over here. So the last page of the second row. Again, I'm trying to get this this page done in two months instead of three months because it is like a lighter page in terms of density 
and uh, trying to get a little ahead of myself to represent how much, you know, for this piece to represent our time here in North Dakota, since I don't, could be three years, could be four years. So I didn't set up my fabric before. So there's the whole piece so far. I did 1300 stitches. So there's the entire piece. And just like I thought, this page is going pretty quick. Um, all I've had, like, I tried to, to get through two thirds of the page, so I only have about a third of the page left to go. So just got to bring it down here um, to finish off that row in November. Again, this is 28 count even weave by MCG Textiles uh, in the mushroom colorway and DMC 3808. So that is Big Red Ship of Life. I did see that um, Ink Circles, you know, last year I think they released a moderately sized um, Big Red Ship of Life, which is just a, a smaller version. And they recently uh, released a comparatively small Ship of Life. So if you like this look, but it's just too big for you because it is enormous, well, let me get the stitch count for you. Stitch count is 345 by 421. So if you want this look but um, something smaller, check out their other, their moderately sized and comparatively small ships, Ship of Life patterns. Um, so... That is ink circles. And then the fourth piece I worked on was Card Sharp by Omar Rayan. This is the piece I started in June. So I'm up here on page one. And this is a dark corner, if you will, even though it's an arched window. Dark corner of the window. I did finish page one. Um... So in total, since I started the piece, I have 8,810 stitches done. And let's see, 2,600 of those were done in June. So do the math. That's how much I've, I've done on Card Sharp this month. So I finished the page and I finished Shenandoah National Park. So now I have 24 out of 25 national parks done um, in full coverage fanatics. The only one left is on Kindred Spirits, which I'll also show you. So here's my page finish on Card Sharp. I did not have a goal on this one since I did start it this year, but it's nice to get that first page done. Uh, I took a picture and put this on Instagram yesterday and I kind of wanted to like do this to like bring more light to it, but it's just a, it's a dark corner of the design. <laughs> It was kind of like an optical illusion, like I, I could, by putting it more under the light, it would brighten up the, the page, but no. So that is page one. And this is a uh, 28 count, uh, easy count. Most of my full coverage are on 25 count, but then, you know, earlier this year, I bought two yards of 28 count because I couldn't get the 25 and... There we go. This is the first one I started on 28 count. So that is page one. Now this piece is huge. It's 625 by 800. So you can see I have a very long way to go on this one, but I think it's going to be really cool to work on. The advantage to a really large piece is really good detail. So I'm done with this one for the year because I still have other goals and I need to reach. So plans. I'll work more on Halloween rules. My last out of the stash at last start is this um, chocolate heart or heart of chocolates. This is from the Cross Stitch and Country Crafts, January, February, 1995. 
And I didn't even look up to see who the designer is. I don't want to take up the time to flip through the pages. Designer is Jeff Jolseth. Valentine Candy. Or Candy Heart is what it's called on the on the Flosky. So, yep. Looking forward to making that. And I'm using Antique White uh, 28 Count Jobelin that I just bought from Hobby, Hobby Lobby. So, that'll be my start on Thursday. And then I'm also going to work on Kindred Spirits. I'm going to switch it out on the scroll frame with Card Sharp because this is not my last goal, but it's my last full coverage that I have quite a ways to go. I set a uh, goal of four pages this year, and I only have one done so far. I don't know. I don't think I can get, you know, two and a half pages done. But I'd like to get at least three pages done for the year on it. Um, we'll see. If, we'll see if I can do that. So here's where it is so far. And this is one where I'm just like uh, France Forever. I'm going to do diagonal pages. So I'll do this one and the one next to it and then move down even further. So I'll try to get this page done. I don't know if I'll be able to finish it in October. I am working on it in December for Around the World Challenge in Full Coverage Fanatics. Um, but I'll probably keep working on it sporadically in November too. Try to get some, some more done. So that is Kindred Spirits. So Halloween Rules, The Candy Heart, The Kindred Spirits, and um, as of Wednesday, I will be able to do a whole row on the 52 weeks of Blackwork uh, Sal by Peppermint Purple. So I'll try to squeeze that in rotation this week as well. So we'll see how much I get to. That is it for my stitching content. Um, if you want to hear an Air Force story, is stick around. My only life update is we got our first snow last week. Um, they were forecasting anywhere between three to six inches of snow in my area of North Dakota. And we got hardly a dusting. Like, barely enough to see. It looked more like a heavy frost on the grass and on, like, the roofs of the houses. So, um, the weather guessers were incorrect. But they are forecasting one to two more inches tonight into tomorrow. And then another couple inches Wednesday and Thursday. Which is, I guess is two different storms, according to them. But uh, we are below freezing. We've taken all our hoses inside. And the pumpkins are inside. So we can carve them later this week. Because um, you can't carve a pumpkin that's been, that's been frozen and thawed. So... Air Force story. I have visual aids. We're going way back in time to 1983. We're going to talk talk about F-15s today. Um, oh, before that, I wrote a note to myself because um, I keep forgetting to include everything. When I was talking about my husband's long flight a couple of weeks ago, um, what I didn't mention last week was that you know I talked about the go pills and the no go pills. Um, he did not end up taking any of his go pills, the Dexedrine. Um, all he had were like energy drinks and he took like about five 20 minute power naps over the 36 hours. Um, if you've ever watched the TV show Deadliest Catch about crab fishing, um, you know that those guys, they'll be up for day, days at a time. And the only sleep they get is when they're going from one chain of pots to another chain of pots. So like 20, 30 minute power naps. And even Mythbusters um, has done a, a show where they test it out to see how well those 20 minute, 30 minute power naps um, can do for you in terms of keeping you acutely you know, aware and able to respond and um, keep your reflexes up. And so that was interesting. 20 minute, 30 minute power naps do work. Um, 
even though eventually at some point you do need to get a longer chunk of sleep. But yeah, with the with the energy drinks and the um, the power naps, he was doing just fine. He came home and uh, took a four hour nap because it was it was morning. So you know he got home right before my kids went to school. He took a four hour nap, got up, ate lunch, and was able to last until you know regular bedtime for us. So um, yeah, thirty six hours he he did sleep, but only in in power naps. And the one bed on the airplane, um, they reserved that just for the three pilots that were on board. So two two pilots always in the seat and one pilot was sleeping or just resting. So that's how they managed. And then the other, you know, other guys on the plane were just taking power naps in their ejection seats. So that's it for the long flight, I promise. Now to 1983 flying f-15s we are over israel um israel was the first uh allied country that we sold f-15s to um the f-15s entered service in the u.s in 1976 so we're a few years later i don't know when exactly we sold the the f-15s to israel but in 1983 flying over israel um a two ship of f-15 d models so that the two seaters um, and they're primarily um, flying doing air to air or, in, or air to ground they can do both but they were flying a mission with four a4s so let me show you what an a4 looks like so the a4s were the were the bad guys in this exercise so that's what an a4 looks like it's old plane so Two F-15 D models were flying against four A-4s to simulate dogfighting. So there's your there's your F-15. This happens to be a D mo or a E model because it's a dark gray and it's got extra the conformal fuel tanks on the side, but it doesn't really matter for the story. So there's your um, F-15. They were flying against them, and in the U.S., when we're practicing dogfighting, we have a rule to keep a 500 foot um, safety bubble around the airplane so even though you're dog fighting and you're doing all these maneuvers you try to keep that 500 feet apart for safety sake and you you know you simulate shooting missiles and um you can simulate you know locking on with a gun and things like that well uh, what happened is and actually if you go down in the, de in the description box I will post a video which is a snippet of a uh, show off the History Channel where they actually interviewed um, the pilot about this incident that I'm going to talk about. So they were dogfighting and the A4 was inverted. The F-15 was above and shot a missile at the A4 and he didn't know that the A4 was inverted and, and going up. So they're belly to belly, they couldn't see each other. Midair collision, okay. Um, the F-15 starts diving, not not really steep, but about three degrees, and it starts going into a spin. Uh, his depending on where you read this, the story that the pilot said calls him his navigator, but other places call it his instructor. Um, told the pilot to eject, but the pilot was higher ranking, and he started to be able to get control of the F-15. So he decided not to eject um, and to try to save the airplane. So he <clears throat> put the jet into full afterburner, so moved the throttles all the way forward, and was able to come out of the spin, come out of the dive, and level off. Now, what they were then able to see, looking over at their right wing, they could see all this fuel spilling out. And... Um, when you're flying this fuel coming out it comes out as vapor okay so it's not liquid it's still like fog it's vapor it's hard to hard to see so they could they knew their aircraft was damaged but they couldn't see to what extent and so they're still an afterburner punching it the nearest airstrip is 10 miles away and they actually successfully land the airplane now let me um the a4 when they hit um the A4 pretty much just disintegrated and the pilot punched out. So uh, he was fine, but his airplane was gone. Let's see. Read my notes. 
The recommended airspeed for landing an F-15 is 130 knots or uh, 150 miles an hour. Now, because they had to keep going super fast to be able to stay aloft and keep control of the airplane, he, they he ended up landing at about 260 knots, so double the recommended airspeed, uh, which is about 300 miles per hour. They did drop their tail hook to catch the, the barrier, which is like that wire um, on the runway, to try to help them stop because they were going so fast. But the tail hook is not rated for double the landing speed. So the tail hook got ripped off the airplane and they stopped. Um, let's see, I read 10 meters from collision uh, in his interview or somewhere else. I, I saw 20 feet, so somewhere, somewhere in that range there because it's not exact. And so they were able to land the airplane without a wing. Because what they what they weren't able to see, because of all the fuel vapor, you know, sp spewing out of the airplane, was that they had no wing left on the right side. So here again, the picture of the F-15 from the top. So the wing was completely gone, right about from the root. He still had a full. Uh, we call them stabilators, and I'll explain that here in a second. And of course, both flight surfaces is on this side. So I want you to notice how wide the F-15 fuselage is. It's pretty wide compared to... Oh, I hit the wrong button. Now here's an F-16 from the top. Um... And you notice the fuselage, yes, the F-16 is noticeably smaller than the F-15 in, you know, the, all of it, but it also, it has a much narrower uh, fuselage, the wings are smaller, um, so if this had happened to an F-16, it never would have made it. The F-16's nickname is Lawn Dart, because um, not only does it have one less engine than the F-15, so if you lose your engine, you're going down, but the glide slope, so how well the airplane can glide without power, um, is not good at all. So if this has happened in F-16, he never would have been able to make it the, that 10 miles. So let's see. Now I have pictures of the actual airplane. And again, if you go to that video link below, you'll be able to see part of this. So this is actual... This is a still from actual video taken of the airplane. You can see the fuel vapor. All right, so this is why they, plus, you know, their visibility is limited as to how far they can see behind them anyways. Um, so they could not tell that their entire right wing was missing. And here's a blurry picture, but you can see once they landed, there's no wing there. Okay, so <clears throat> they went back and studied this case after after they landed successfully to figure out how this was able to happen. And, it, and they did say it was because the fuselage is so wide and they were going fast enough that uh, the fuselage with the left wing were able to produce enough lift to keep the aircraft airborne. Um, the other thing to talk about when you're looking at aircraft parts, and this is probably what you recognize um, for flying commercially. This is what a, a regular tail of a commercial airplane looks like. So you have the ver vertical stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer, and then the moving flight surfaces are your rudder and your elevators. Now, on both the F-15 and F-16, they don't have the split here. The entire surface moves. So that's why we combine the word elevator and stabili stabilizer to make a stabilator. So the entire surface of that um, horizontal flight surface moves and they can move independently. So their, their horizontal stabilators can, can move completely independently of each other. Now, um, they still have the vertical stabilizer and the rudder. 
it's not the top half the you know the top fin if you will does not move the entire piece it's still just a portion just like on a commercial airplane um so that's one thing a lot of fighters will have a stabilator to create more maneuverability um and also that probably that stabilator because it's so large and because the whole thing is movable probably also helped it um fly the rest of the way to the airstrip now what's really interesting to know about that particular airplane that lost its wing um prior to that day the aircraft that particular aircraft had um gotten four kills in the lebanon war in 1982. after they studied it and they determined what was wrong they put it on a truck and they shipped it to their equivalent of a depot they put a new wing on it and started flying it again and two years later it got another air-to-air -air kill of a syrian uh, mig-23 so uh, just to show you how um, rough and tough the f-15 is just a really cool f-15 story for you of um, managing to fly 10 miles and land successfully with only one wing um, and if you do watch that video uh, interview a couple of things there are some uh, dramatized footage that they've tried to recreate what the crash would look like but they do have interspersed little snippets of actual footage where you can see the airplane flying with just one wing so um, anything like that's in the cockpit looking like he's he's spinning and trying to control the airplane that's dramatized recreated for the History Channel show. But you will see um, footage of the airplane um, flying and landing and uh, being parked with just one wing. That is uh, actual footage of the real airplane. Um, the pilot said that had he known that he was missing a complete wing, he would have punched out. But again, you, you have to make split, split second decisions on how the aircraft is responding and how much fuel you have and if you think you can make it to that nearest airfield um, and he made it so pretty incredible story that's your air force story for today i hope everybody has a good stitching week and watch my instagram stories to see if we get any snow this week um, it's been cold the the wind chill in the morning has been in the teens so um yeah if it's gonna be cold i'd rather have snow but at the same time, who wants to trick or treat in the snow? I'm not sure. Um, so we'll see what happens. All right, guys, have a good week. Bye.